Okay, let's look at this in a minute. Um, all right. In there, I see an auditor uh, very self-conscious and conscious of the power of emotions in life. And in some ways, you could see it in the last quote he has about Franklin. He quotes Franklin, who says, you cannot show anything useful to lazy citizens. One of the best or worst comments I could have about my teaching is when they say he teaches with a passion. Students like it, but it doesn't tell them me anything. Of, are they learning anything, right? But passion means a commitment. Passion for learning means letting it come into your soul deeper, does it not? To be embedded more into yourself, right? And in there, what struck me is he's doing philosophy in the midst of World War I. Not philosophy of war, but philosophy about philosophy, right? He loved poetry, and he had his favorite poet. Some say Namik uh, Kamal in, maybe influenced him choosing the name Kamal rather than his math teacher. Who knows? I don't know. But there's always a place for him in poetry. And if you think of what poetry does, when it is, and uh, one of his uh, comrades says, Ataturk wanted to memorize Vatan in its entirety. Let it go deep into his soul. Poetry touches the emotion. It captures things that sometimes concepts cannot accurately capture, but it puts you in an emotional state, right? If I may share one of the things that I could see uh, was in my dad. Uh, I remember we were, I'm Polish, we were raised speaking Polish at home, we're immigrants. Uh, in Washington with the immigration debate, I'd like to underscore, we came through Ellis Island legally. <laughs> but what was interesting is we, I was at a party, a young kid, and there were people who were drinking, Poles, you know, like to drink and stuff. And at one point, my dad is called up on the stage. And he comes up on the stage and he starts quoting these famous poets, Polish poets, including Mickiewicz, who died in Istanbul, the great national poet of Poland, I can feel that connection to Turkey through the spirit of Mickiewicz. But, Mickiewicz, but uh, what struck me was the power of the poetry. That's how Ataturk understood emotion. Uh, and when he's talking about language reform, education, literature, and poetry are important. No arguments about the value of humanities as we sometimes have to argue, even though he understood Turkey needed scientists, engineers, business people, but he has, seems to be listing literature, poetry as an also important, the complete person, is it not? Okay, uh, I still have about an hour, right? Half hour, right? Okay, uh, let me now uh, point out that in my mind, a person sensitizing themselves to emotions and doing it systematically is really trying to develop the intuitive sense of life. And you could argue, even though you may say people might have emotional problems or challenges, I think Ataturk had what we would call emotional intelligence, and he worked at it. To be able to discern people around him, not just what they said, but listening to them, observing them, and being able to craft that intuitiveness that's so important in life, isn't it? You can't live without it. If you've got it, you're, you're dangerous because you can't hide things. Other people cannot hide things from you, okay? Now, in there too, I think that emotional part with poetry and listening, I think one of the things that some generals will say that's so important in, in leadership is to have an empathy, be able to connect people from all walks of life, and not to feel uncomfortable. Some of our greatest leaders, you could say that people said when you met their eyes, and Ataturk had the beautiful blue eyes, apparently a gift from God maybe to really capture the individual's presence, is that he focused in on you. And he's focusing on that peasant. Who knows what he's thinking about that peasant? He could be saying, this is godly gook, I can't do anything for him. But he's listening to him, right? He's giving him a say. Picture captures it. 
Now let's transfer this uh, knowledge, uh, insights that I've gotten in Ataturk by looking at his military side. Let's transition and looking at how he's developing as a statesman. One of the things that's interesting in his notebook as an officer going through, uh, as a student going through uh, the war college, not the staff college, is in addition to those three questions I, I told you he asked, he also lists three things that are important, and I'm getting another three here, that are important. And the first thing he lists is policy, ideas, the power of ideas in warfare. And what Anatur strongly believed in, he was fighting for independence and self-determination. Those were prince, that was what a goal that was noble. It was to give dignity to the people of Anatolia, not to experience colonial rule. In his book, Conversations with an Officer and a Commander, Ataturk uh, makes this comment. Human beings can only be commanded and directed when their aspirations and ideas take concrete form. It means a commander has to what? Embody the goals and values of an army if he wants it to be successful. The problem is what happens if you're in the wrong war? It's going to be all sorts of problems. Interesting enough, he cites three historical figures that are great examples of this. How many of you have heard of the three examples? Okay, this is a teaching point then. Okay. First one is Moses. He fulfilled the desire of the Jews to be free of slavery and oppression under the yoke of the Egyptians. The second one is Jesus. Jesus addressed the hopes of the poor in the form of a religion based on compassion. Is that the essence of both those prophets? Us Catholics, the Son of God, but powerful thing. The third one is Napoleon. He embodied the ideal of military glory as he traversed Europe. This is early in Auditor's military career. His, probably his views on war will be undergoing a little bit of change once he's gone through and, and created independence. Because remember, he calls this uh, government that he's forming, he has a ministry. It's not called the Ministry of War. It's called the Ministry of National Defense. Isn't that interesting? Before Europe, I mean, uh, France, I think England, they still call it, you know, war. He's calling it national defense. The least one, right? As the Italians would say. Okay. Uh, so in the war, he embodied the struggle for independence, a simple goal. And I caught that, I found that I, there are a lot of documents about auditor. The one that struck me was June 9th, uh, which is really early on, after he landed in uh, Samson on the 19th of May, a 9th of June, after he's figured out the situation, made some comments about what the military situation is, he's a uh, general inspector, he says this, public demonstrations have been born of national conscience. That's how he describes it. So we've had demonstrations against the occupation, against the partition, and he sees it as an act of national conscience. And then he says, the goal is to defend the rights and independence of the nation. Simple goal, commanders are told, keep it simple, stupid, right, kiss principle, he's keeping it stupid. And then he says this, and I think it's a powerful statement, I promise to work with all my being for our national independence. I promise to embody that struggle in my heart and soul to make this work. Now, as a commander, he has to make a transition to uh, statesman. And doesn't he, he, he's handsome in, in a civilian garb too, right? And he does it through uh, national congress, uh, regional congresses. What is striking is, and this is a point I knew, I didn't even have to do the research, but I could talk about it in staff college. What is powerful about the example of Ataturk is you have a successful military commander who in this war, understands that it's more of a political struggle than a military one. We have to gain the population on our side. We do have demonstrations against the occupation and there's national uh, turmoil. People are willing to fight, but not everybody is. 
and we have to gain legitimacy for our cause, not try to work through the Sultan in Istanbul. So he dons that civilian clothes and uses the Congresses to gather legitimacy for himself. First there's the Heirs Room and then the Sivas Congress. Another little, what's so beautiful about the end? There we are at the Heirs Room Congress, a small building, right? You see it there? And then all of a sudden, Turkish students came out. There's an American here. And look at those eyes. Would that we approach knowledge with that same kind of enthusiasm as you see on some of those faces, right? And then the prophet is out without recognition, his hometown, but he has to travel abroad. They put me on TV in Erzurum. <laughs> and look at that. I mean, if you look at this, it just the faces and their intensity, you get a sense that they're appreciating. And when you appreciate, you absorb things more, right? Look at the face. The contentment of the teacher and the smile of the student. Okay. Now, Parliament has been closed by the great powers in 1920. Those deputies that can escape the Ottoman Parliament, which is now under Allied occupation in Istanbul, come to Ankara to reconstitute a new parliament. And this is what Ataturk says to one of the people who comes to talk to him. As this parliament is going to be about ready to start convening with elections to get more delegates in because some have been taken prisoner, this is what Ataturk says to his colleague. Unje Mejlis, Sonra Ordu. First we build the parliament, then we worry about the army. He is lucky, though, that it's not an army that's moving to the capital, right? But he could still have taken a different route, but he understands that the parliament is the key, and it leaves a legacy of what? People power, elections. There's a democratic spirit in this, and Ataturk is learning to work with it, right? He goes to meetings and has to listen for hours. He learns something about democracy there, okay? Now, as... Um, here is the, you don't see this in the, the standard classics. I thought it's important. Maybe there's one that might, there's a Congress that he holds that I think is very critical to understanding him as an emerging statesman. And it's a dramatic event. I'll explain why. On the 16th of July, 1921, he gives a speech to the forming Education Congress. And in there, he talks about this as a Congress of Knowledge and Culture of Learning. <laughs> and he says, our goal is to establish a national program, a culture of learning conducive to the development of an improved intelligence of the people. The literacy rate in Turkey at this time is probably around 10, 15%, very low. Uh, and this is what he says to the teachers. You are involved in a struggle too. There are two types of war we are facing. One is against the enemy, we will use our weapons. The other one is against ignorance, and we'll use our minds. And as he's doing this speech, I, I, I'm, I'm dramatized, you know, let's say, I, I'm doing this, he's doing this speech. Stand up for a second, just for a second. This is our turn, and I go over here, and I go, boss, boss, the front is collapsing, you gotta get out there. After he's done with the speech, gets on a train, I think it's, and he zooms off to face the Congress, uh, the situation on the front. It's collapsing. It adds a certain drama to the event, does it not? You put a place for that, which is looking to the future. So in war, good leaders look to the future after war, right? And interestingly enough, when the war is over, between the, there's no war and no peace, you have to defeating of the Greeks, you've got Izmir, you've got the Treaty of Lausanne, what does Ataturk do? He holds, goes to an education congress being held in the newly liberated town of Bursa and addresses the teachers there with the same message. 
And then when he gets rid of the caliphate, there are three laws that are put out on that same date. One gets rid of, the, abolishes the caliphate. One of the reforms is what? National education. Isn't it amazing, these connections? that sometimes are not thought through, but just kind of treated in isolation rather than looking at how they might be interconnected uh, and relating to his character. <coughs> now, may I just share one last famous order? A in Parliament. And this is the Great Offensive. This is the book. Okay? It's too early for a blitz screen, but it says, Don't the heartbeat, right? Lightning war, where monitor helps to put together, it's a plan that the staff puts together, he had some final touches, concentrating on the flank, breaking through, and then uh, defeating the Greeks and chasing them to the sea. Great race to visit. Turks come out of the woodwork, or out of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> this man 